Just before we get started, I want to mention another channel that I host called Mega Projects. Mega Projects is a channel all about mankind's greatest achievements, where I take a deep look at incredible buildings, projects and structures, and more. Whether it's the world's most impressive skyscrapers, the International Space Station, or Chernobyl sarcophagus, I cover it all. New channels come out a couple of times a week on Mega Projects, so if you think that could be for you, please do head over there and subscribe. There is a link in the description below. And let's get into it. The Spanish flu was the single worst disease episode in modern world history. In the space of 18 months, in 1918 to 1919, its four epidemic waves killed tens of millions of people around the globe, ravaging a population that had already been exhausted by the mass killing tactics of the war to end all wars. In the video today, we're going to look at the Spanish flu from three perspectives. First, how did it spread across the world and what was its impact on the everyday lives of ordinary individuals? Then, we will profile this invisible killer, seeking to understand its origins and murderous methods. And finally, we will assess the death toll it inflicted on the human species and see what we can learn from the experience. And with that said, let's get into it. The term Spanish is, of course, a misnomer. It would be more appropriate to call it the Great Influenza Pandemic of 1918-1919, so I will use both terms. The epidemic did not originate in Spain. It received this honorary citizenship only because Spain was a neutral country in World War I, and its press was free from censorship to report first about this mysterious disease. The origins of the pandemic lay elsewhere, though. Most contemporary accounts place the first outbreak at a U.S. Army training training base Camp Funston in Kansas in mid-March 1918. It is here that this flu virus reaped its first 48 victims. But we'll never know for certain if that was the true starting point. The online archive of California holds in their Spanish flu section a letter written by a young recruit, Roy, from Camp Logan, Texas. On the 1st of March 1918, he laments, We played another funeral today. One of the lads from Company 1 died. I knew him real well. Another funeral on the 1st of March would imply that soldiers had been dying throughout February. But the origins of the Great Flu can be traced even earlier than 1918. As early as 1916 and 1917, army camps in France and in England had been ravaged by an unknown respiratory disease. At the time, it had been described as purulent bronchitis, but its symptoms resembled those of the Spanish Flu. However, these outbreaks did not spread beyond the two military bases and had died down by April 1917. Historian Mark Humphreys of Canada's Memorial University of Newfoundland in 2014 proposed another origin story. Humphreys found archival evidence that a respiratory illness that struck northern China in November 1917 was identified a year later by Chinese health officials as identical to the Spanish flu. From China, British officials organized the transport of 94,000 laborers to the Western Front via North America as part of an auxiliary corps in charge of digging trenches and maintaining supply lines. The laborers were sailed to Vancouver on the Canadian west coast, then loaded onto trains to Halifax on the east coast, from which they could be sent to Europe. The press was forbidden from reporting on these transports, and the trains had been sealed. Both were meant as a precaution in order to protect the laborers from widespread anti-Chinese sentiment. But the unintended effect may have been to further the contagion amongst the auxiliaries' ranks. Some 3,000 of them, while traveling through Canada, were quarantined with flu-like symptoms. And of course, newspapers could not publish a single word about it, meaning the infection trains could continue their eastwards run. The Chinese laborers arrived in southern England by January 1918 and were sent to France, where a hospital at noyelle sur mer recorded hundreds of their deaths from respiratory illness. Whether because of the Chinese laborers or U.S. Army recruits, large movements of troops were accountable for the rapid diffusion of the virus. Between May and July, the Great Flu had spread across virtually the whole of North and Central America, as well as Europe and Asia. The Pravda region in Russia wrote that the Spanish lady had thrown a whole town, Moron, into disarray. The Times of India reported that nearly every house has some of its inmates down with influenza fever, and every office is bewailing the absence of clerks. 
The epidemic had an obvious impact on the war, which was still raging especially on the Western Front. German General Erich Ludendorff complained that it was a grievous business having to listen every morning to the Chief of Staff's recital of the number of influenza cases and their complaints about the weakness of their troops. He would later even blame the failure of his spring offensive on the virus. This was all the first wave, which seemed bad at the time, and it actually was pretty bad, but it was nothing compared to what was going to come next. During the first sweep of the Spanish Lady, the influenza virus probably went through a mutation process which made it much deadlier. This enhanced killer made its first appearance in late August of 1918, when the second wave took off almost simultaneously from three major wartime ports – Boston, USA, Brest in France, and Freetown in Sierra Leone. From the three ports, thousands of sailors, soldiers, and civilian travelers became vectors for the virus. Aboard their ship, in a matter of weeks, the infected spread the disease across the four corners of the globe, with only a handful of remote locations being spared the ordeal. The second wave dragged down throughout the whole of autumn and the early winter of 1919. The end of the war on the 11th of November 1918 did not mitigate the onslaught. Arguably, it just made it worse. Millions of soldiers were demobilized, hundreds of thousands of POWs were turned home, carrying an unwanted stowaway inside their lungs. A whole generation of young men had been decimated by artillery, weaponized gas, machine gun fire, and those who survived were likely to die because of a single droplet of saliva. It took only one single virus inside a single droplet out of 40,000 ejected by a single sneeze, and just like that, you were infected. The feeling of the fragility of life in those times is captured by the everyday correspondence of ordinary people. In September 1918, a post officer worker in Plymouth, Massachusetts, wrote to his wife about the grueling conditions he worked in in order to ensure a continuing service amidst the constant death caused by the flu. I have some more very bad news to write you, and I guess if things keep on, that by the end of the year, there will be nobody left in town. Harold Ashley died yesterday. Harold will be buried just as soon as his body arrives, and there will be no funeral. On Friday, we had seven funerals, and Saturday, about as many. So, you see what we are up against. In Brockton, three days last week, there was one every hour. On the 11th of October, a recruit in training in Michigan wrote to a friend that in his camp, 50 die every day from it. From the 16th to the 27th of October, a series of letters from Mrs. Alma Senior to her daughter Alma Junior show how unbreakable a mother's love can be. Writing from Rochester, New York, Mrs. Alma worries that her daughter is safe and healthy in her college in Ontario, Canada. Some of the motherly advice may resonate with what you hear these days. She wrote, "...was just wondering how you were getting in these days of epidemic. In the country, it is fierce, and so many dying. Over here is something awful. People are dying, and it's awful." Don't worry or fret, because you can only walk in the yard. Be glad you can do that. Keep in fresh air all you can, and keep warm. Put your bathrobe on at night. Hot lemonade at night is excellent for influenza. Mrs. Alma then laments that she cannot help her other daughter with her little baby Jane because she is invalided at home, and that it is impossible to get nurses. While worrying about the well-being of her daughters and doing what she could to help her granddaughter, Mrs. Alma was ill with cancer. Maybe unable to access medical care earlier because of the pandemic, she was eventually hospitalized on the 27th of October and died on the 6th of November. On the 31st of October, an official at the mayor's office of San Francisco took the initiative to notify his counterpart in Santa Barbara about effective public health measures in his city. Sending this for your information because I have seen the whole terrible effect of epidemic here, because masks have saved untold suffering and many deaths, and because Santa Barbara is my old home city. The measure in place was simply the universal wearing of masks. Three days after the use became general, new cases in San Francisco dropped by 50%, but the daily death toll was above 100. On the other side of the pond, London was being stricken as hard as New York State, California, and Ontario. On the 28th of October 1918, one Mrs. Bennett wrote, Things here are in a terrible state, this new flu taking people off as they walk along the streets. In fact, the undertakers can't turn the coffins out or bury the people quick enough. There's families of six or seven in one house lay dead. On the same day, an American soldier stationed in France wrote to his mother, reassuring her that the situation where he was stationed was not as bad as it was at another base, Camp Sherman. He also mentioned that 
The French people have a way of treating the flu. They make some kind of tea of some kind of leaves. Unfortunately, he didn't provide the recipe. Another series of letters from an American private provides a good example of acquired immunity. Martin Aloysius Colhane, known as Al, was stationed at Camp Forest, Georgia, from where he wrote to his brother and to his best friends. While he mourned the death of his bunkie Thomas, he was in relatively high spirits. He had survived the great pandemic not once, but twice. I am still in quarantine, but I will be released today. I am feeling great, and the two days rest has done me a world of good. His main concern was that while in quarantine, he had been neglecting the ladies. So he asked his friend, Cliff, to check on Ursula, Ella, Ida, Mary Rose, Mary English, and Mary Ann. So was Al simply lucky in love and health? Well, there is strong evidence suggesting that exposure to previous waves of the Spanish flu could generate acquired immunity in those who had been infected but had survived. Research led by Dr. J.M. Barry from Tulane and Xavier University's Louisiana highlighted how the first wave of the Spanish flu was characterized by a high number of cases but had a lower fatality rate than the second wave. By looking at medical records of U.S. soldiers, he estimated that the fatality rate during the lethal autumn sweep was 4.7%. In the spring, it had been only 1.1%. However, the deadly barrage of the second wave had largely spared those who had previously been exposed in the spring. The case of Camp Dodge illustrates this part. Perfectly. Here, one regiment of troops had experienced the first wave, while another regiment had escaped it. Among those exposed in the spring, only 6.6 .6 became sick with flu that autumn. In contrast, among the troops not exposed in the spring, a staggering 48.5% fell ill during the second wave. Now, the witness accounts and research mentioned so far may refer to America or Europe, but this should not give the impression that other continents were spared. Let's go back to September 1918. This is when Indian troops who had served on the Western Front returned home. The first outbreak took place in Bombay, where mortality rate was more than 5% of all the population. The Spanish lady had now access to a huge new territory densely populated, serviced by a large railway network. It was the perfect storm. In just a month, the flu had spread to Sri Lanka and to the northern provinces, reaping an estimated 14 to 18 million lives, the highest death toll recorded in a single country. Also in September, a troop transport sailed off Bombay to Mombasa, Kenya. Of course, the virus was a stowaway. The infection spread to members of the Kenyan carrier corps who were just about to be demobilized. As they returned home, they carried the contagion inland, adding to the death toll caused by the other two major African outbreaks originating in Sierra Leone and South Africa. Most of Africa had been spared the first wave, meaning that the autumn burst had cruelly scorched through the continent. Towns like Kimberley, Addis Ababa, and Windhoek lost over 4% of their populations to flu. The bulk of the victims were between 18 and 40, so the effect on society was disastrous in terms of loss of labor, reproductive capacity, and family structures. It was a sudden demographic, social, and economic catastrophe without precedent. Back in India, by November, the rate of contagion had largely subsided. It is speculated that this was due to the onset of the monsoon season, as humid climates are not favorable to flu viruses. The march of the invisible tyrant nonetheless continued eastward, reaching China. Until now, the majority of the victims worldwide had been aged 15 to 34, an age bracket unusual for influenza pandemics. We'll find out later why this group was particularly targeted. In China, the second wave preyed on an even younger cohort, children aged aged 11 to 15. Overall, the mortality rate here was much lower compared to India and other countries. Researchers from the Hong Kong Institute of Chinese Medicine theorized that traditional Chinese medicine might have actually played a part. Remedies put in place by local government included spraying houses with lime water or burning rhubarb and root stalks to disinfect the air. For prevention, villagers were advised to drink mung bean soup and rock sugar. Another explanation is one hinted at earlier. Since the pandemic had originated there, Chinese citizens had already developed an immunity to it. By the early months of 1919, the rage of the pandemic was relatively tamed, and I stress relatively there. The early spring of the year saw a third wave making the rounds throughout the globe. Although it did not matter the speed, reach, and virulence of the autumn wave, it was still deadly. On March the 5th, 1919, a young Canadian man, Harold, wrote to a friend in Illinois, There are an awful lot of people dying right now on account of the flu. A little girl next door was buried today, and there is a lady up the street that is pretty sick, and my little sister is just getting over it. So I guess it is pretty near my turn. 
We don't know if Harold made it or not. The third sweep was followed by a fourth wave, less severe, which lingered on in locations such as Scandinavia, the South Atlantic, and Sicily. It is still debated whether this was a mutated strain of the original virus or a new one altogether. One of the final victims of the fourth wave was a little girl from Palermo, Rosalia Lombardo. She had been born on the 13th of December 1918 at the height of the autumn flu in Europe and passed away aged only two on the 6th of December 1920. Her father, aggrieved by such a sudden and meaningless death, asked for her body to be preserved as if she was still asleep. One century later, Rosalia can still be seen sleeping in the Capuchin catacombs of Palermo. This unwitting memorial to the great pandemic is now known as the most beautiful mummy in Europe. At a high level, flu viruses are divided into four types, A to D, and type A's can be divided into further subcategories depending on the subtypes of two proteins present on their surface. These are hemagglutinin H and neuraminidase N. The influenza virus responsible for the 1918 pandemic was identified as being a type A H1N1 subtype. Viruses of the A H1N1 type are actually quite common among humans, but we'll find out later what made this specific virus so special and quite so lethal. A 2001 study suggested that the 1918 virus may have originated in swine hosts before moving on to humans, but another investigation in 2005 suggested a more likely source was birds. The enteric tracts of waterfowl, such as ducks and geese, are known to be the reservoirs for all known influenza A viruses. For those of you not au fait with physiology or anatomy, the enteric tract is the nervous system that regulates digestion. Within the original host, let's say a duck, the virus may mutate over time either independently or by recombination with a gene segment from a different virus. Now that the pathogen is mutated, it's ready to jump species, usually from avian to mammal and attack a new type of cell, for example, those lining the lungs. This is almost certainly what happened to the Spanish flu strain, and we should stress almost. In two separate studies of 1999 and 2005, Oxford University and the Atlanta Center for Disease Control were able to reconstruct the genome of the original virus. What they found is that the 1918 influenza was composed of eight gene segments, all distinct from any of the hundreds of both avian and mammalian viruses collected since 1917. This was literally one of a kind. The unique quality made it impossible to ascertain who or what could have been the original host of the virus and how it evolved into its lethal final form. Another clue, normally outbreaks of viruses with an avian origin are preceded by large die-offs of poultry or other bird populations, but this was not the case with the 1918 pandemic. The initial animal host, the patient Alpha, is still unidentified. One thing was clear about the 1918 H1N1 virus. Its virulence and pathogenicity were unrivaled compared to other viruses which both preceded it and followed it. To clarify these points, pathogenicity is defined as the ability of an infectious agent to cause disease or damage in a host. Virulence, on the other hand, is a measure of the severity of said disease. A microorganism can be pathogenic or not. If it is pathogenic, its virulence can vary from mild to fatal. Let's look at pathogenicity first. Contemporary normal flu viruses require the presence of the enzyme trypsin in their human host in order to replicate. The 1918 virus instead could proliferate even in the absence of trypsin, making it more pathogenic than other viruses. The Spanish flu also displayed a unique capacity to proliferate at high rates inside human bronchial cells, and that explains its virulence. Little by little, a picture of the killer was emerging thanks to modern researchers in the role of crime scene investigators or criminal profilers. The next step was to understand how Mr. Type A H1N1 of the 1918 class actually killed what was its modus operandi. 
Enter Dr. David Morians of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Maryland. In 2007, he reviewed autopsy records for influenza casualties in the 1918-1919 to period and identified two overlapping syndromes which caused the death of the infected hosts. In at least 85-90% to of cases, patients suffered from an acute viral infection that spread down the respiratory tract, causing severe tissue damage inside the lungs. The damaged tissue was then invaded by a so-called secondary invasion. It wasn't a virus this time, but rather bacteria. Pathogens like Streptococcus or Staphylococcus would invade the damaged lungs, causing cases of aggressive bronchopneumonia. In other words, the killer virus did not act alone, but had accomplices. The actions of these cohorts eventually led to severe pulmonary hemorrhage and necrosis, or tissue death, within the bronchi. The remaining 10 to 15 percent of fatal cases suffered from ARDS, or acute respiratory distress-like syndrome. Patients with this syndrome could be easily identified by their peculiar blue-gray facial discoloration, a typical sign of drowning, because. Well, that's essentially what was happening. The virus caused the pulmonary blood vessels to exude huge amounts of thin, watery droplets which clogged the lung tissue. In other words, these patients were drowning in a liquid created by their own bodies. So now that we've clarified the modus operandi of the killer, we have to understand its peculiar choice of victims. Normally, flu epidemics claim most of their victims among the elderly, but the Spanish flu had a clear predilection for a younger demographic, those aged between 15 and 34. A lower than expected mortality among the elderly may have been explained by acquired immunity. Individuals aged 40 and over may have been exposed to one of the three flu pandemics of the 19th century in 1830, 1847, or 1889. Although not everybody agrees, unlike the 1918 strain, these previous viruses did not cause aggressive bronchopneumonia nor lung hemorrhage. We may have more convincing answers explaining why the death rate was higher among the young ones. Dr. Robert Snellgrove from Imperial College London, among others, has theorized the notion of the so-called cytokine storm. Cytokines are proteins released by cells to interact with each other and trigger specific proteins. Processes. For example, internal inflammation, a common reaction of the body against infections. A younger organism would naturally release more cytokines than an elderly one. In the case of the Spanish flu, the cells of the infected younger patients released a deleterious excess of cytokines, leading to excessive inflammation of the lungs and, more importantly, tissue necrosis. Ironically, younger, fitter organisms deployed a stronger reaction to protect themselves, a reaction which eventually claimed their lives. Shortly after the last wave had died down, the scientific community tried to take stock of the magnitude of the disaster. American bacteriologist Edwin Oakes Jordan was one of the first to calculate the death toll, which he estimated to be in the vicinity of 21.5 million people. The number in itself is staggering. Compare it to the casualties of the Great War, which was about 10 million dead soldiers killed over a period of four and a half years. The Spanish flu killed twice as many people over little more than a year. Now let's compare it to the world's population in 1918. At that time, there were 1.8 billion people on the planet. The Spanish flu killed 1.2% of them. If we apply that ratio to today's population, that would have been a death toll of more than 93 million people. Oakes Jordan's estimate stood for decades, but it was later challenged as being too low. First, a 1986 publication calculated the mortality in India alone to be at 18 million people. Subsequently, in 1991, authors David Patterson and Gerald Pahl proposed another estimate, placing the death toll between 25 and 40 million victims. But was that the definitive number? Probably not. A 2002 study by Dr. Neal Johnson and Dr. Jürgen Muller suggested that the previous numbers may have been underestimated due to common issues such as missing records, misdiagnosis, or death certificates compiled by non-medical personnel. Not only that, deaths among indigenous populations in colonial dominions may have been overlooked, ignored, or simply not reported to the colonial authorities. Also, most of the reports collected at the time of the pandemic referred to deaths taking place during the major wave of autumn winter. Influenza mortality before and after that wave may have been ignored or reported under other causes of death, such as pneumonia. All in all, considering all these instances of underreporting, Johnson and Mueller placed their estimate in a range from 50 to 100 million dead. 
And let's stop for a second just to consider that. A hundred million dead. The entire US population at the time was just 108 million. The whole of Latin America had only 57 million inhabitants. Sometimes numbers may not be enough to represent the sheer scale of a tragedy. So just think about it this way. In a matter of a few months, one USA or two Latin Americas had been completely wiped out by a microscopic being which had likely originated in the bowels of a duck. In all honesty, the more we researched the death toll, the more we found conflicting accounts ranging from the top counts of 100 million down to 18 million. We will likely never know how many people did not get to see their next year because of the great killer of 1918 and 1919. In our grim research, we also came across an even bleaker notion. How many victims didn't even get to see their first day of life? In other words, the impact of the great influenza on unborn children. Dr. Bloom Feschbach of Mount Sinai School of Medicine, New York, and her team have examined the relationship between influenza and birth rates during the great pandemic in the US, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. The analysis showed a decline in birth rates for all examined populations in the spring of 1919. This decline represented a 15% drop below baseline levels recorded before the pandemic. This natality depression reached its maximum levels about six months after the pandemic peak of the previous autumn. This suggested that the decline in births could be attributed to a surge in first trimester miscarriages, which affected about 10% of all women who were pregnant at the peak of the pandemic. The conclusion of the bloom Feschbach team is that the virus was directly responsible for the miscarriages, and the 10% incidence rate may have been an underestimation, as they they point out a 1919 report of 1,350 pregnant women with influenza showed how more than a quarter of them had miscarried. The concept of so many babies not even being born is hard to accept, but the same study revealed another finding, which shows that regardless of the disaster, our species is always capable of bouncing back. The dip in birth rates in spring of 1919 was followed by a compensatory natality increase in late autumn 1919 and early spring 1920, when natality significantly exceeded the expected rates. The resurgence of births confirmed that fertility was not permanently impacted. Humanity could slowly rebuild itself, lick the wounds inflicted by the double tragedy of the Great War and the Great Pandemic, and slowly return to normal. Return to a daily life and to historical periods that was going to be devoid of war, famine, and disease, at least according to some leaders. A period which turned out to only be a 20-year truce, but, well, that's another story. Back in 2004, a team at the Harvard School of Public Health had modeled the transmissibility patterns of the 1918 virus. More precisely, they calculated its reproductive number, R, in relation to its serial interval, V. The R number tells us how many secondary patients are produced by each primary patient. The V value is the average time expressed in days between a primary and a secondary case. The team evaluated that the 1919 virus had an R0 value of 2 to 4. In lay terms, the infected patient could infect four more patients in less than a day. This may sound like a high rate of contagion, however, the researchers pointed out that this was not that high in relation to other influenza subtypes. In their estimation, a similar pandemic could be prevented by vaccinating or administering antiviral prophylaxis to 50 to 75 percent of the population. And that sounds pretty easy, but it depends on how well prepared a national health system is when it comes to facing such emergencies. Stockpiles of vaccines and antivirals may or may not be enough, or these drugs might not be available at all, still progressing through the early stages of a clinical trial. There's also the added problem that flu viruses may be transmitted before the onset of defining signs and symptoms. In other words, people infect each other even before they appear to be sick. So, what's left to do? Well, I'll quote directly from the clinical paper. This implies that measures that generally reduce contacts between persons, regardless of infection status, may be our most powerful protection against a pandemic until adequate vaccine and antiviral medicines can be produced, at which point mass vaccination and prophylaxis may be more effective than targeted approaches. And with what's going on in the world today, we hope that this video, this message perhaps, has resonated with you. You've heard it a million times. We've all heard it. Until we're through this current emergency, staying at home is our most powerful protection. Stay at home, stay safe, watch some biographics.
and thank you for watching.